Hey, welcome to Gold Scratch. So, uh, if you've been on my channel before, and especially if you're a 307 fan, you've probably seen this engine before. Yes, a year ago or so, I made a series of videos about a 307, and it was a pretty uh, video that caught a lot of interest for me anyway. And probably because there's not a lot of videos about 307s out there. And uh, I went through the stages of receiving the grungy old original engine of a 69 Chev truck that had never been out before, uh, all the way through the teardown, cleaning, selection of parts, uh, design, assembly, start up on my test stand at home, and running it out of the dyno. And uh, all that went pretty well. And uh, I actually ran this thing on the dyno, made 10 or 15 pulls on the dyno, took it back home, uh, and did all my diagnostic checks before I delivered it and delivered the engine and a year later about only about a thousand miles I think later uh, based on the information I can gather uh, it's back here and it's a sad story uh, because I love working on engines but I hate doing anything twice but uh, it's going to have a happy ending and if you stick with me for a few minutes uh, you'll see how so what the heck happened? Uh, you've heard me say in the past, if you watch some of my videos, if you survive, if the flat tap mechanic survives the first 10 or 15 minutes uh, on the startup, and it's done right, it's probably going to have a long and happy life. And uh, that's not true in this case, because we had a great startup. There were absolutely no issues. The dyno performance was fine. And here it is back again. So a year later, uh, it's got a couple things going on, the valve lifters are getting noisy and it's got low oil pressure, especially at idle. And I can tell you that, I, that the engine went through some kind of trauma. Uh, it was run for a period without gauges and so we don't really know, but it went through some kind of trauma during this period and uh, net result is it's got to be built again. So it, it had low oil pressure and once again the camshaft went pull the camshaft out uh, not all of the some of the lobes are rounding off so uh in the disassembly so it has to be completely built again one of the things that if a, a cam failure doesn't just destroy the cam the collateral damages damages everything else too because all that shrapnel gets into the oil yeah you have an oil filter <laughs> but it finds its way into the oil, gets into the bearing, scratches up the bearing, scratches up the crankshaft, and uh, and does damage there, and uh, so it needs really a complete and total rebuild. So I've done that. I've taken it completely apart, and magnaflux the crankshaft. That's another thing I have to point out. The crankshaft was magnaflux before it went in; it was fine. We checked it when we got it back out, and it's got a crack in it. So. That's other evidence that it's been through some kind of trauma that I can't I can't quantify it. But it doesn't matter. We have to fix it. And fortunately, I have a very understanding uh, customer who just wants to do things right. And uh, we're working together to solve this. So a couple of things I did notice on the disassembly. I mentioned the crankshaft already, but on the oil pump, uh, if you're familiar with how an oil pump works, You've heard the term pressure relief valve is just a single, simple little uh, plunger held back by a spring in the bottom of your oil pump. And as the pressure gets too high, the spring plunger moves against the spring, allows oil to divert from the pressure side to the intake side, and thus reduces or limits the amount of oil pressure the engine can have. That plunger and this oil pump was stuck. And if it sticks at the open position, it'll be dumping oil back to the intake side of the pump uh, when you don't want it to, when the oil is hot and uh, you don't need to reduce your, your pressure, uh, it's just going to dump the oil back and you're never going to build good oil pressure. So because we had very low oil pressure at idle. So the uh, question is, did the pump fail and stick and that caused the camshaft to fail or did the camshaft fail? And, and all the debris from the camshaft, some of it got into that little plunger. It's a very, very uh, small. The plunger is probably only three eighths of an inch in diameter. And uh, it uh, slides back and forth into very small clearance and uh, even a little piece.
piece of shrapnel gets in there, it can make it sick and it was stuck. So obviously a new pump. So chicken or the egg, who knows what really happened. It doesn't really matter. We have to fix it. So one of the things, one of the issues uh, that I've talked about before, and there's lots of information everywhere on, on YouTube and whatever about uh, flat tap and camshaft failures. It is an epidemic and it's not getting better. It's getting worse. Apparently one of the issues is the OEMs don't buy any flat tap cams, flat tap lifters anymore. So the big manufacturers have just stopped making them. That's a lot of lifters coming from God knows where. And, uh, and the, the, if you look at the comp cams recommendation of flat tap lifters, you need to nitride your camshaft. You need to use special expensive lifters that have, that are hardened and have a little hole in the bottom. Uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff that you have to do. By the time you do all that stuff, uh, you, have to, you, have, you have to groove your lifter bore so that oil can, extra oil can be squirted onto the camshaft flow. And of course, follow all the startup procedures, which we do anyway. By the time you do all that stuff, you can buy a roller cam. Thus, we're putting a roller cam uh, into this engine. And so that's the, sum, the subject of this video is conversion from a flat tap to a roller cam. And some of the things that you have to think about and, and you have to do if you want to have a successful conversion. It's not a big deal, but you have to pay attention to the details of it. The only bad thing about a roller cam is that it costs a lot of money. And the roller cam setup is more than three times cam lifters together, more than three times the cost of a flat type of cam lifter. So, uh, and if you don't, and you don't actually, even in the range of this engine with a fairly small cam, it doesn't necessarily make more power. And a roller cam does. If you get up in the big range, you have solid roller cams, six, seven hundred dollar lift, absolutely. But on a street engine, uh, a roller cam won't necessarily make more power. So there's not that bad incentive. The real reason you want to use one is for reliability and have a long, happy life. So, so my customer agreed to do that. So we're putting a roller in this in this uh, in this engine and converting it to a roller cam from a flat type of cam. And uh, so uh, first of all, let's talk about the cams. So the original cam that we had in it was a fairly small cam. Please remember that this is a, a full size truck uh, and it weighs, you know, 4,000 pounds or more. It's got a stock torque converter, stock rear end and an automatic transmission. And this is only 300, uh, 307 and even when it's bored, it's, it's 312. So, it, a cubic inch to uh, weight ratio is something more than 12 pounds per cubic inches. So that's a pretty heavy ratio. And so you can't use a big cam. It might look great on the dyno, but it's not going to do good in the truck. What we need in the truck is good throttle response, drivability, low end torque, and, and mileage as well. So uh, the original cam was only a comp uh, 256 uh, flat tap of cam. And it had uh, at 50 thou, 212, 218, and 450, 445, 454 lift. So uh, a nice mild cam, which uh, should give you good low end power and all the things I mentioned. The roller cam replacing this is, is a comp 258, uh, even though it's two degrees more. Uh, 258 inch hour, of course, for hydraulic roller, and even though it's a little more lift, or a little more duration at 6 thou, uh, it's only 206, 212 uh, degrees duration. And back to, I mentioned this before on cam shafts, uh, flat tap of cam can actually lift the valve off the seat faster than a roller cam. Thus, even though they start off at the same place at 6 thou, the initial start of the ramp up, uh, the the Flat tap the cam by the time you get to 50 thou, it's the way ahead of the, of the roller cam. It's uh, the flat tap was 212, 218, and we're 206, 212. However, the other side of the story is once the roller cam gets going, it will lift the valve faster up the ramp and hold it up, go higher and hold it up longer. So, as a result of that, the roller cam I'm putting in, even though it has less duration at 50, has more lift and more area occurred in that area. So 
So you have to attend to that as well. So a couple things you have to be sure that you check if you do put a roller cam in. Uh, of course, the, the link the roller cam solution is is link wire lifters, and uh, so a couple things you have to to make sure of is first of all valve springs, and you need to pay attention to valve springs. You just can't go and put a hydraulic roller where you had a hydraulic flat tap of cam. And in most cases, the valve springs for a roller are bigger than the valve springs for a flat tappet. If you buy aftermarket heads, typically for a small block, if it's for a flat tappet can, they'll have 1.25 diameter springs and 100 pounds on the seat and maybe 270 pounds open. If you buy aftermarket heads for a roller cam, it'll be the 1.45 diameter or in that range. And they'll have 130 pounds on the seat and 300 pounds open. So typically you need bigger, stronger springs for a roller cam. However, um, because these are both pretty small cams, we got away with something here. And that is the uh, comp recommendation uh, for both cams was the same. Uh, it's uh, uh, because they're sm it's a small, if it would have been a big cam with 600 pound lift, it definitely would not have been. But they're both 981-16 uh, springs, so that was good. So another thing you have to pay attention to though, now we have more lift. We had only 454 now, we have 4, 485 lift, 487 lift on the exhaust valve. So the spec for the spring is the maximum lift is 490, and we're 487. So we're getting pretty close. And uh, so you need to pay attention to that. So the, the, uh, the issue that you have to be concerned about is if you have too much lift, you're going to coil line when the spring is open. So the spec is if you have 1.7 installed height in the spring and 490 lift, you will have about 60 thou of clearance when the spring is fully open before you get the coil line. And so I had to disassemble all the springs. And even though, you know, unfortunately we got lucky, it's the same spring that's recommended by comp. Uh, but I had to disassemble all the, all the springs and check the install height because they were originally assembled by the machine shop, uh, Atchison Machine Shop in London, Ontario, and they're very reliable and I never worry about the quality of the work. But in this case, I had to be sure. And to make sure I have at least 1.7 installed height or, or slightly more, and it was okay. But had it been, say, 1.6, and when the spring got down to full open with uh, point, almost 0.50, 0.4, Eight seven lift, you would have gone into coil bind, and then lots of well, lots of bad things can happen when that uh, when that takes place. So, so that's been done. The next thing, which is pretty obvious, or most people have run across this, and I'm going to cover a couple of options, and that's controlling the movement of the cam in the engine. And uh, if with a flat tap the cam, it's pretty easy. The the, the lifters, uh, the cam lobes actually have a small taper on them and the, the lobe of the cam rides on the edge of that taper. That causes the lobe to rotate and also creates a thrust that pushes the cam, tends to push the cam to the back of the block. And that's retained by the back of your timing gear. You know, there's a surface in the back of your timing gear that pushes against the block. And so it's not an issue with a flat tap of cam. With a roller cam, you no longer have that thrust. So your cam is free to walk back and forth. So what stops it? The back, once again, the back of that timing gear is going to stop it going into the motor. Uh, on the other side, the the cam, if it wants to walk out, uh, is kind of free to do. You got a chain on there, of course, and all that, but it can move. If it moved a lot, it would actually the lifter would fall off the lobe, and then a whole bunch of bad things would happen. You have lifter smashing in the lobes. It's very unlikely it would ever move that much. However. Uh, there's another factor. If it moves at all, it's going to disengage the uh, mesh between the, uh, the gears that control your from your distributor drive to your camshaft, and it's going to affect your timing. So your timing is going to be jumping all over the place if the cam is walking. So you have to manage that. And so what I did was, in this case, and I've done it successfully before using a steel cover and this little nylon button that you can buy for like $20 or less. And you put that button in the back of your timing gear like so, and you put your cover on, and you 
put a dial indicator. I open, take the plug, plug out of the back of the block. So I put a dial indicator right in the cam shaft. I put a screwdriver into the hole. You move the cam back and forth, and you can measure that clearance. So I got it right on. I got it right on. Five to ten thou is the spec, and I managed to do that with my dial indicator. And then I took the dial indicator and I moved it to the other end and pushed it against the cover. And guess what? It's moving five to ten thou as well, which tells me the cover is not not strong enough to hold the movement of the cam. Now, is the cam going to fall out of the engine? No, it's not likely going to happen. However, you will have a ratty ratty timing, and you have, still have to manage and control that. So. Uh, I've, I've gone away without doing it before. I talked to the customer. He was happy to, and once again, of course, we have a guy that likes to do things right. So we're going to use a Ploys uh, aluminum tying cover, and it has an adjustment device. So you bolt the cover on, and there's a little set screw that you, you know, still have to measure your cash out float uh, to verify it. But the instructions are you just tighten it up against to push the cam to the back, uh, timing cover, timing gear to the back of the block, uh, and so that it's actually contacting back off. I think quarter of a turn, and that gives you like five thou or less of clearance, and you're good to go, and it's not an issue. One of the other ways that I didn't mention uh, that I could have used, you can buy water pumps that have a, a special adjustment screw that push against the timing cover as well, and that's another way to do that. So. Uh, if you're converting from a flat tap to a roller cam, those are things that you have to think about. Uh, once again, even though I, I initially thought, okay, I got it, and go to the front and the, and the cover is moving. Even though I thought that was a clearance, it wasn't. It was actually that easy to flex the cover. So in this case, the Koi's cover will solve the problem. It's not, a, not an inexpensive way to solve it, but it will solve the problem. So. That's where we're at. Uh, we're going to install this roller. I've got the camshaft degreed in already. I just finished doing that. And so now I just got the cover yesterday. I put the cover on now. Uh, put the, can the cans in for the last time. Put the oil pan on. And started to put the lifters in and the heads on. The only thing I have don't have yet is push rods. I can't determine the length of my push rods until uh, I, uh, I mock up the heads and do all the, uh, the mocking up the procedure to determine the length that I need with my adjustable push rod, so I can't do that. Otherwise, I'm ready to go. We are going to be making future videos of this engine running on the test stand, and on January 14th, we're going to dyno it again. And what are we trying to prove here? We're, we're not trying to prove big horsepower. Uh, it's the ultimate torture test and tuning test to make sure we get as much power out of it as we can. If you watched my previous uh, dyno on my video about my 427, we went from 400 and less than 450 horsepower to 479 horsepower by making changes on the dyno. If you had stuck that engine in your car and you weren't able to do that, you'd be giving away 30 horsepower. So uh, that's certainly well worth the investment, I feel. And we also know that the engine's good and sound, doesn't have any leaks, runs well, do all the diagnostics after. It's ready to go in the car with no issues or worries about its long life or, uh, or, or the hard longevity in the car. So that's a bit it for now. Uh, thank you for watching Gold Scratch. Like, subscribe. Sure, I'd like to have you do all that as well. Uh, it motivates me to make more videos. I hope that you found uh, this a little bit helpful. Whether you're putting a cam in a 307 or anything else, it doesn't really matter. The process that I described is exactly the same, and the experience with flat tapping cams. Uh, all I can say is, you know, there's just it's this risky business using them, and and I can't really say it was the cause of the lifters or not that, that took this one down. And to be sure, it's the, if it is, it's the worst first flat tapping cam I've lost uh, in this century. So uh, that's on me, I guess. If it is, I really can't. Can't tell, can't be sure. Okay, uh, thanks for watching and uh, look for future videos of this 307 running on the test stand and on the dyno on January 14th. Thanks for watching Gold Scratch.